Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is a great turnout, given how beautiful the weather is, and I think a real tribute to our distinguished guests this afternoon. Welcome. This is the George Washington Leadership Series presentation. Our distinguished alumnus, Richard Wood, comes from a strong family stock of entrepreneurs whose business endeavors in the Philadelphia area have spanned two centuries. When Richard's grandfather, Graham Wood, opened the first Wawa food market in Folsom more than a half century ago, it was the latest in a series of businesses that included a dry goods store in Woodbury, a vast iron foundry and cotton mill complex in Millville, aptly named, and a dairy farm in Wawa, Middle Township, which gives the company its name. While grounded in family history, the Wawa business model that helped it emerge as one of the most successful enterprises in the convenience store industry is all about staying current. We need a something besides convenience store. New, because it's, 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 it's so much more. New markets, new technology, new services, and innovative branding distinguish Wawa from all the rest, attracting loyal customers who have gotta have a Wawa. Today, the company operates more than 540 stores, and I understand they're rapidly growing throughout the Mid-Atlantic region, and consistently ranks among Forbes' top 200 privately held companies. Accompanying Richard today is the man who helped achieve Wawa's rapid expansion. Howard Stokel, now Vice Chairman of Wawa Inc., first joined the company in 1987 and worked with Richard's father to help craft the unique Wawa experience. Since accepting his initial position as Vice President of Human Resources, Mr. Stokel was promoted to positions of increasing responsibility, including Vice President for Marketing, Executive Vice President, and Chief Retail Officer. Under his guidance, Wawa has grown into a well-known company that competes against the biggest industry players in the world in three areas, fuel, convenience, and food, all while maintaining their personal approach and small business mentality. Mr. Stokel talks about the core values that revolutionized the convenience store in his book, The Wawa Way, and will be available to sign copies of that book, and it's a wonderful book, following today's program. So please join me in welcoming Howard Stokel, and following his remarks, both Howard and Rich would be happy to answer questions from the audience. Howard, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm delighted to be here today, represent the uh, 24,000 associates who deliver the Wawa brand day in and day out. When I joined Wawa in 1987, my job became one of nurturing and manifesting the culture, being a storyteller, and supporting those people who deliver the unique Wawa brand. And when you think about it, Wawa is a privately held company. It's been around for hundreds of years, as you will see, and we compete with some of the world's biggest companies. We compete with Starbucks. We compete with McDonald's, and believe me, they're big. We compete with ExxonMobil. We compete with Dunkin' Donuts, Subway, huge companies. But yet, Wawa has been able to survive, stay true to itself, and compete in this very competitive world. So I hope to take you over the next 45, 50 minutes inside Wawa and talk about Wawa's DNA, Wawa's culture, and Wawa's competitive advantage. Wawa's competitive advantage, yes, we sell great hoagies. Yes, we brew coffee. Yes, we sell gasoline for less. But what we really market is the experience, our culture, our values, and that's what customers love. You can't take longevity for granted. If you want to endure, you have to engage people. You have to become endearing. You sit here. This is an old institution. It's endured. It's been here for hundreds of years. It'll be here hundreds of years in the future. And that's what we're concerned about at Wawa. So I'd like to start and review our history and take you back in time.
impressed with uh, the, the, the family atmosphere of Wawa. That's what's uh, so important, that everybody feels included. Times change, and boy, have we changed with the times. And in business today, what's really important is to preserve your underlying reasons for success, but yet change with the times. Otherwise, you become irrelevant. So let's talk about Wawa. Several years before I retired, I thought it was important that we talk about our history. And we were turning 50 years old in the retail business. We started in 1964 and thought there was a need to capture the history of the first 50 years so that future generations of leaders would understand what we stood for, what were some of the mistakes we made along the way, because we've made our share of mistakes and we've learned from our mistakes, and how have we changed? Because if you don't change, simply put, you don't succeed. So we had never really published a book completely about our modern day history, so that's what we set out to do. And when you think about the Wawa way, it's really more than a book title or a theme. It's a way of life, a guide for valuing people, and a roadmap for building long-standing customer and community relationships. And that is ultimately a report card. That's ultimately what makes Wawa successful. And you think about Wawa today, and you look over the marketplace, we've had people that have gotten married in our stores. We've actually had weddings. It's a convenient, low-cost wedding, but they meet every <laughs> single day at the Coffee Island, and they strike up a relationship. Over to the right, this was during the hurricane several years ago in New Jersey. This young woman, she's in the water. What is she holding? Her Wawa cup of coffee. To the right, you see a lot of I Love Wawa t-shirts. Actually, some people do wear tattoos. Uh, I Love Wawa. And when we opened in Florida in the upper center, People waited in line for 24 hours to be there for the first store in Florida. So Wawa is about winning hearts. Wawa is an emotional brand. Some years ago, the New York Times did an article, and they said, if you look on social media, you see Wawa everywhere. Wawa, Wawa, Wawa. And they said, if it were a rock band, that wouldn't be unusual, but it's a convenience stores, because that's why we endear people to the brand. The Harvard Business Review did a study about creating a living brand and how important the associates of the business were to Wawa and to other leading convenience retailers in creating that living brand. We have over a million Facebook uh, users, well, which is pretty good for a company our size in the marketplace today, and it's growing. When we had troops that went to Iraq and Afghanistan, the thing that they missed the most, their Wawa coffee. And we ship Wawa coffee over to make sure they had Camp Wawa uh, in their barracks. We had a group of young ladies some years ago who wanted to raise money for melanoma, and what did they do? They visited 586 stores within a short period of time to raise money for melanoma uh, for a friend's memory. And recently, Wawa was named America's favorite convenience store. And why? Because it's friendly. You know, it's what I call the cheers of convenience stores. If you remember the TV show Cheers, and some of you may be too young to remember that show, but it was a bar up in Boston, a place that people gathered. They had fun. They felt safe. It was a family. And that's what Wawa has become, a place where you have fun, you simplify your day, you see familiar faces, and you feel good. So that's winning the hearts of our consumers. So what is Wawa today? Well, we build over 80 million hoagies a year, uh, and it's growing. We sell almost 200 million cups of coffee. Uh, over 25% of the cups of coffee in our marketplace are Wawa's cups of coffee every single morning. We have over 600 million customers annually, and we have ATM machines, but we don't surcharge you to get your very own money. And we've saved customers since 1996 over $3 billion in fees to access their own money. Today, we employ over 26,000 people. About half of those people are associate owners of the company. We have 722 stores, and out of those stores, 475 sell gas. 20 years ago today, we had no stores with gas. You talk about embracing change. 
Within two decades, we've gone from a non-gas retailer to the most dominant gas retailer in the market, and we sell 2% of all the gas in the United States in our 475 stores. We're currently in six states, five mid-Atlantic states, but now we're in Florida, and I'll talk about our migration to Florida. Well, we weren't always a retailer. You know, we've had successes and we've had failures, but our business goes back almost 300 years. Now, you're associated with George Washington. We were associated with Abe Lincoln, and over 300 years ago, he was a lawyer in Springfield, Illinois, and he actually represented the company when we had stores. Uh, and we needed some legal advice. But the Wawa business started out very differently. The first product line was an iron factory uh, and made water piping for the city of Philadelphia, made fencing for the city of Philadelphia, and actually made fire hydrants. If you go to New Orleans for excitement, you want to look at the fire hydrant, look at it, you'll see the name R.D. Wood. That was the parent company, the, find, the founding family parent company. That evolved in the textile mills in South Jersey, uh, cotton bleacheries, and actually the owners of the business had the largest cloth baby diaper business in the nation called Red Star. Now, it's a good thing we're not in that business today because there's not too much of a demand for cloth baby diapers. And then George Wood decided to move to Pennsylvania, went into semi-retirement, bought a house in what is Wawa, Pennsylvania, and decided to buy land up the street and started herring and imported cows from the Isle of Guernsey uh, and the British Isles. And this was before pasteurization. This was before Louis Pasteur. But physicians would recommend, particularly pediatricians, Wawa milk uh, to the mothers of newborns because it was safe and certified. And we had standards that were extremely high uh, in terms of quality. So beginning in the early 1900s, the dairy became a very significant business. But then in the 1960s, stores were opening everywhere. People didn't necessarily want home delivery of dairy. So the question was, the family had a dairy, had all these wonderful people who worked in the dairy, and it was Graham Wood, a family member's responsibility at the time, what do we do next? How do we sell the dairy products that they're producing? What do we do with the dairy? He wanted to preserve the jobs because he had seen in New Jersey in the iron business and the bleachery that people had lost those jobs when those businesses went south in more ways than one. So he said, I'm going to open stores. And he went out to Ohio, studied the convenience store business, and came back in 1964 in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, and opened this first store that sold dairy, uh, bread, grocery, uh, produce, and deli. It was the alternative to the supermarket because believe it or not, supermarkets were not open at night, there weren't Walmarts around in those days, and the stores were closed on Sunday. There were actually blue laws where big stores could not open on Sunday. So convenience stores were the alternative to supermarkets back in those days. So that's how the business got started, to protect and to preserve the jobs of those wonderful people who worked in Wawa Dairy. That's true servant leadership. That's putting others first. Graham would never have envisioned that the Walla business would be where it is today. That wasn't the game plan. In fact, someone who lived right near the first store, uh, he's a professor at St. Joe's University, happened to be quoted uh, about five years ago in the newspaper saying, Rich George noticed the brand new Wawa store not far from his home and wondered what milkmen were doing selling groceries. So it's a very different business, our first step in the retail business. Some milestones along the way. In 1975, we sold bread, we had deli, we had produce, but we didn't make sandwiches, we didn't make hoagies. Customers would come in and ask our store managers, can you make me a sandwich? Our enterprising store managers on their own began to make sandwiches, and that turned into a major corporate program, something that we're known for today. Coffee started in the stores. A store manager came in, brewed coffee for himself. Customers would come in and they would say, can't you brew me a cup of coffee? I love the aroma. No, I can't. It's not a corporate program. I'll lose my job. They did it nonetheless. And today, coffee is our number one profit maker. 
listen, listen to your customers, listen to your associates, empower people, get out of their way, they'll do wonderful things, they'll take you to extraordinary places. We haven't always been successful. We've had our ups and downs in business. And there was this period of time back in the late 80s, what we call the dark days, where our customer count and our sales were going down. Uh, there was a recession, our prices were too high, and we certainly were not in alignment with our consumer. We learn more from this period of time than probably any other time in our history. You learn from failure, you learn from disappointment. And we found that our prices were too high, and simply put, we were doing way too many things. And the customers were confused as to what we stood for. So during the dark days, we dramatically lowered our prices, dramatically lowered our prices to bring more customers into the store, and we invested very heavily in the training of development of our people so that we could build a sustainable business model for the future. Most companies, when things get tight, don't spend money, they retrench. We did just the opposite, and we worked our way out of the dark days. A key milestone was in 1992 when Dick Wood, the CEO, uh, created the Employee Stock Ownership Program. And that's when we began to share ownership with our associates. Our associates have always had an emotional connection with the company, but now they began to have a financial connection with the company. And at first, it was modest amounts that were shared with our associates, but we'll talk more about that. In 1994, we stopped building these small stores. We began to build big stores on big properties so that when people drove down the highway, they would recognize who we were. Now, we made a mistake. In these big stores, we said we have all this space, we want to sell more products, and we put in Dunkin' Donuts, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut. And it failed miserably. We went to customers and our associates and focus groups, and they said, that's a crazy idea. Why would you do something of that nature? But nonetheless, other C stores were beginning to do it. They were gonna partner with Pizza Hut and Taco Bell and Dunkin' Donuts, so we said, maybe we should do it as well. Well, we put in 150 Taco Bells, we took 150 Taco Bells out. We put in 400 Dunkin' Donuts, we took 400 uh, Dunkin' Donuts out. The moral of the story is listen to your customer, listen to your associates. They either give you permission to do something or they don't give you permission to do something. But ever since then, we've built big stores. But the difference in what we learned from Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, Dunkin' Donuts is sell your own brand. Customers said, you pasteurize dairy. You make milk, you make eggnog. There isn't anything that you can't make. We trust you, Walla Walla. So they gave us permission to expand our own line under the Walla Walla name. In 1995, everyone was putting in ATM machines. But we said, let's dare what others don't do. And that is not charge you to get your own money. Because other institutions we're charging people, back in those days, 50 cents a transaction, and now you go to an ATM, if it's not your own bank, it can be $2 a transaction. And we didn't think it was living our values to have people have to pay to get their own money. So the fact that we didn't surcharge created an exceptional value and a halo over our brand. In 1996, we opened our first fuel store in Millsdale, Millsboro, Delaware. You can see the price, 99 cents. Don't think it's gonna go back to 99 cents, but boy, it's come close to it uh, here recently. And customers were saying, well, the gasoline retailers are selling food. Why don't you sell gas? And we had a board member who owned a company that sold gas and happened to sell food too, and the board member said, you have the best offer in the world inside your store, the only thing you're missing with gas. So Dick Wood decided that we would enter the gas business. If you build it, will they come? Well, they came in record numbers. You have a big store with big gas and a big low price. It works magically. And ever since then, we've only opened stores with gas. It's important to note that 15 years before, we got out of the gas business. We had been in the gas business and failed miserably because our sites were too small and we co-branded with the national brands. And it was like having a noose around your neck, having ExxonMobil and these brands 
tell you what to do. So we did it completely differently. Big site, Wawa brand, and we priced it. The major oil company didn't price it. So we've always said at Wawa, in many cases we fail first, but we learn from our failures and move on. In 2000, we put in touchscreen ordering. And up to that point, we had delis and customers would come in, they'd order a sandwich, they would talk to the person behind the deli counter, he or she would write down the order, and they'd produce it. Somewhat slow. And our business was growing so quickly, how do we keep up with it? And we love customers, but we only love customers for five minutes at a time because we need to get customers in and out because if not, you drive by the store, the parking lot's filled, and you don't stop. So touchscreen ordering was our first venture into major technology that was customer interfacing. People resisted at first, and now they wouldn't live without it because if you use the touchscreen, it's fast, it's simple, and it creates more accuracy with the order. In the year 2000, a major milestone. We were owned about 75% by the family, the Wood family member, but we had a minority shareholder who wanted to sell. And they had bought into the company five years ago to buy out some of the family. And they thought if we went public, we would be the darling of Wall Street. Well, we really didn't want to go public because we didn't want to be controlled by the public markets. We looked into private equity and having another firm come in and buy part of the company. But we weren't too enamored by that because if you have private equity monies in your company, they can control what you're doing. And there have been several convenience stores just recently that had private equity investors that only owned 10, 15% of the company, but they completely destroyed the company and had a different point of view as to how the company should be run that led to the dismantling of those companies. So we weren't enamored by Wall Street. Dick Wood and, uh, has always been passionate about private ownership and controlling our own destiny. So we said, how do we buy out this shareholder? How do we give them money? The answer was offer Adam, our associates an opportunity to buy into the company. So they had 401ks with Fidelity. And we actually did the offering to our associates. We said, if you'd like to buy Wawa stock, and you can't put any pressure on, you can't influence them, you can't even be objective about the opportunity, that will keep us private. And we needed about $45 million at the time to keep us private, and our associates had about $100 million in their 401ks, and they rolled over $69 million to keep the company private. Now, when they did so, they did it because they wanted to keep the culture of the company alive. They wanted us to maintain a long-term point of view. They bought in at $888 a share, $888 a share. Today, since the year 2004, 12 years later, it's worth about $7,600. So an emotional investment, an investment that came from the heart, turned out to be a huge financial investment that has dramatically outperformed Wall Street. In 2007, we had another recession. And we are about ready to open stores in Florida. And we pulled the plug and said, this is no time to open stores in Florida. Customers have the pangs of anxiety. They're worried about the stock market. They're worried about their financial institutions. So what we did was lower prices again, as we had done back in the dark days, increased our value proposition, and invested more in associate benefits. And we came out of this downturn stronger than ever before and our sales grew tremendously. In 2009, we actually, through a third party, we became such a big buyer of gasoline, leased storage tanks in the port of Wilmington, Delaware, so that we can import fuel from around the world. Because we were buying fuel from Sunoco and our competitors, and they could pull the plug on us at any time, because we are a competitor, so we wanted security of supply. 2012, the biggest strategic decision we've made, I think, in the history of the company, and that was to go to Florida. We were a local company. All of our stores were within 150 miles of Philadelphia. We creeped, we never leaped. And we were reaching a point where, you know, it was harder and harder to find real estate. We needed to expand, and you want to expand to grow shareholder value for the owners of the company and to create opportunities for the associates who make us great. 
So the question was, where do you grow? If we went east, we'd be in the Atlantic Ocean. There is no land out in the Atlantic Ocean. If we went north, we'd be up in Connecticut, New York. We had been in Connecticut at one time, had 30-some stores, and failed miserably. We just misread the Connecticut market. So we weren't too excited going back to Connecticut. If we went west, there's a company called Sheets, somewhat like Wawa. But if we went into their marketplace, World War III would break out, and we didn't want to start a war. Then we looked at the Carolinas, a little bit further south, but there were no big cities, and Sheets was heading there, some other convenience stores were headed there, so we decided on Florida. There wasn't anyone like Wawa in Florida. The economy was bad, but it was improving. They had a very pro-business governor, uh, Governor Scott, and that's where we decided to go. The biggest geographic leap we've ever made in our history, but also a strategic leap. So what is our strategic uh, sauce? What is our real competitive advantage? What makes Wawa Wawa? It's our culture. You know, others have tried to copy what we do. They build convenience stores. You know, they come study us, ExxonMobil, Chevron, all these big companies, and they build stores that look very much like Wawa. But they don't succeed, and they get out of the business because they don't have the people. They don't have the culture. They don't have what it takes to run the business. So our competitive advantage and what others find very difficult to duplicate is our culture. And there are three things that make Wawa Wawa. Yes, all these products make Wawa Wawa, but there are three things that are far more important because our product offer has evolved and will always change in the future. Private ownership, shared ownership, and servant leadership. They're the three that make us unique. If you stripped away any one of those three, we would be a very different company. We would not be nearly as successful. In this book by Jim Collins, who's a great business author, he says, enduring great organizations are characterized by a fundamental duality. On the one hand, they have a set of timeless core values and core reasons for being that remain constant over extended periods. On the other hand, they have a drive for change and progress, a great compulsion that manifests itself in big, hairy, audacious goals and operating strategies. Well, those timeless core values and those things that don't change over time is our commitment to our moral compass, private ownership, shared ownership, and servant leadership. We are the 34th largest privately held company in the nation. We don't want to be the biggest. That's never been our goal. With high gas prices, that helps you become the 34th largest company in the nation. Our goal is to be dominant in those markets where we do business. That's why in a lot of markets, you can't drive more than two miles without seeing a Wawa, because we want to be bigger than life. We don't dream to be in every state. We don't dream to be a national retailer. We dream to be the best we can be in those markets we serve. Rich Wood will talk at the end of this conversation about private ownership and family ownership and how we approach it. Shared ownership. The associates in the stores make Wawa great. You know, I didn't go out and work the register. I didn't go out and pump gas. I didn't go out and make hoagies. The people who do that day in and day out, who simplify the lives of their customers, are the people who make us great. They live our values, they live our culture, and they give life and breath to the brand. So sharing ownership, having that emotional connection with the company, but then also that financial connection is powerful. As I would say to our associates, you don't work for me, I work for you. You could fire me. You are the owners of this company. This is an up upside down organization, a wonderful thing. If you look at our ownership structure today, it's over 50% Wood family members, but the associates have gone from like a 12% ownership to a 41% ownership over the past 10 to 12 years. That is a significant stake in their organization. And it's been demonstrated that employee-owned companies are more productive. They have a much higher level of engagement with their associates, and they keep their associates compared with those companies who don't share. Now, as a CEO, it's wonderful working for people and serving people that you see each and every day, 
not working for investors up in New York City who only care about one thing, financial return. Our owners care about the brand, care about how we serve the community, they care about how we value people, and as a byproduct, their investment. And the third thing we believe in is servant leadership. Those leaders who preceded me were wonderful servant leaders. They put the needs of their people in the business first. They put the needs of the business first. Graham Wood and Dick Wood were always concerned about the people working in the stores. When I became CEO, Dick Wood said to me, never forget who your customer is, the people who work in the stores. If you serve them, they will ultimately serve the customers who make Wawa great. So several years ago, we never called it servant leadership. Uh, and we began to call our leadership style servant leadership and put together a program with St. Joe's University that basically trained and educated everyone in servant leadership so that future generations of leaders at Wawa know what servant leadership stands for. And when you think about it, servant leadership, the real leader is not the person with the most distinguished title, the highest paid, or the longest tenure. The real leader is the role model, the risk taker. The real leader is not the person with the largest car or the biggest home, but the servant. Not the person who promotes himself or herself, but the promoter of others. Not the administrator, but the initiator. Not the taker, but the giver. Not the talker, but the listener. Servant leaders believe in the people they lead and are always willing to be surprised by their potential. Servant leaders make themselves available. Servant leaders are committed. They are not simply holders of a position. They love and care for the people they lead. Leadership is both an art and science. Everyone is a leader, and everyone can also be a servant. That really summarizes and captures the essence of the leadership style at Wawa. It's not about the CEO. They come and go. I left the business day in and day out, and the business is doing better. It's thriving. I was the custodian of the business for a period of time. I had that responsibility. You really judge more by the people you leave behind in terms of whether or not they can take the business to the next level, and that's what servant leaders do. Letting ordinary people collectively do extraordinary things. When I started my business career years ago, decades ago, the typical CEO was a leader who directed others, let you know he or she was in charge, made decisions, set the vision, controlled the situation, had authority, and was in the position because of personal excellence. When I grew up, leaders like Jack Welsh were admired. Well, Jack Welsh did a good job. He was in the right place at the right time, but he was a very top-down leader. It was everything according to what Jack wanted done. And that was the leadership style. And some companies today is still the leadership style. And a lot of companies haven't gravitated from what they call the great person theory of a couple leaders knowing everything and running the business. A servant leader is someone who listens, helps others grow and reach their potential, coaches, supports, collaborates, trusts others, empathizes, and accepts the burden of the position as a means of helping others. That's the true leadership style that I think will become prevalent in business in years to come. Servant leaders are servants. They focus on follower needs, and the goal is autonomous. If they focus on the needs of the people that work for them, they'll focus on the needs of others. So it starts at the top, cascades down, and then the people at the top support everyone else in the organization. It's been demonstrated, and here are some high-performing companies in this nation. Most of these companies are or are close to being servant-led companies. I'd love to talk about Southwest Airlines. You know, I go out of my way to fly Southwest Airlines. Even though you have to wait in line and you're an A, B, or C in line, when you get in their plane, it's a different experience. The flight attendants tell jokes. They laugh. You know, if you're two hours late, you don't get upset because they'll get on the PA system and tell you, well, be happy, we didn't crash. <laughs> I mean, I've never heard that in United or American or other airlines. Uh, and they have a sense of humor. They love what they're doing because they're supported by their leadership team. These are just some. Wegmans, the supermarket industry is a tough industry to be in. 
And there may not be Wegmans in this marketplace yet, but they're a family-owned company, 100 years old, but they put people first. And they have redefined the supermarket industry, and they succeed where others cannot. Starbucks is known for investing in people, sharing profits with the company before it was popular to do so, giving people benefits when they're only working part-time because they realized the importance of the brand was that barista in the store. Servant-led companies outperform other companies two or three to one. It's been demonstrated over and over again because they are unleashing the potential of the people that work for the company. Servant leaders set the vision, they define and model the operating values, which I'll talk about. You have to have values because people have to know how to make decisions. So if you don't have a playing field, people will make decisions in very different ways. You have to create the environment where people share a vision as to where you're going. If you don't know where the company's going, how do you get there? You drive around in circles. And then leaders have to move to the bottom to support everyone else in carrying out their jobs. Servant leaders appreciate, respect, develop, and unleash human potential. Now, to unleash human potential, you have to have a value system. People have to be able to make decisions, and they have to know what's right or what's wrong. And at Wawa, we have a very, very strong value system. And every decision we make, every person we hire, has to feel comfortable with this value system. The first value is value people. We believe deeply that it's people who truly make Wawa special. So we want to make sure that we treat people with dignity and respect, and that we listen to people, that we're empathetic. If we connect with our associates, if they're engaged, then they will connect with their customers. We want to delight customers. Customers have cho choices. They could go to Dunkin', they could go to uh, Starbucks, they could go to 7-Eleven. There's any number of places they could go. So we need to be different. We need to make our customers happy. We need to make Wawa a habit-forming business. This is what I call the cheers of convenience stores, a place where you're known by name, a place where you have a comfortable experience. We need to embrace change. We believe change is something to be welcome, not feared. You know, think of Yellow Cab. Did they ever see Uber coming? Think of uh, Blockbuster. Did they see Netflix coming? You have to be willing to look around and determine what could impact your business and try to stay out in front of change. That's why we went in the gasoline business. That's why we're embracing technology with touchscreen ordering, and we will test a lot of other concepts. You have to do things right. You know, we believe that when a customer comes in and they want a cup of coffee, they want it hot. When they want a hoagie, they want it made correctly. Think of Chipotle. They didn't do things right. They claimed they were selling food with integrity, but they didn't sell food with quality. Their foodborne illness issue went at the very heart and essence of their brand. It'll take them years to recover at this stage of the game. They may never completely recover. You have to do things right. You can't take too much risk and you can't take shortcuts. You have to do the right thing. People hold you by very high ethical standards. They expect you to serve your community. They expect you to make your community better. And being involved in our communities in terms of fundraising, supporting local activities, very, very important in terms of our culture. And you have to have a passion for winning. We compete internally, not for ourselves, but for the greater good of our mission which is fulfilling our customers' daily lives. Every single year, we have to raise the bar. We can't be complacent and do better than we did the year before. So we have six values. We celebrate those values constantly. Again, we hire for those values. And if you don't live those values and walk the talk, you don't survive at Wawa. And we have a recognition program where we celebrate over 5,000 people a year with cards and pins who give life and breath to our values. We have luncheons to celebrate store teams that take the values to a higher level because if you don't celebrate uh, what you want to see more of, you simply don't get more of it and we want to see more people living our values. Each year we publish the best value stories in a book 
that we send out to every single store associate. And once a year, we have a Values Day celebration. It's a big party, it's a big event. Every store gets involved, and we have a lot of value activities on that day to remind people how important the values were. And we have a program called Internal Care, where there are people in the company, associates, that need help, they can't pay bills, they've, you know, they've had financial problems, they've had medical problems, and that program's there to loan money, and our employees contribute to that fund, along with our company, to help associates in a time of crisis. So we don't only celebrate good things, but we help people in the time of need. Well, I had the honor of serving as CEO for eight years and serving the stakeholders of Wawa. And there were 10 things that I look back on that I think I learned from my experience. And that is one, you have to build an organization from the bottom up. The most important people are the people that work in the stores. You have to have strength, competence, and engagement at that level. You have to follow your dreams. A business must have a vision for the future. It must get people caught up in that vision. You must be able to stretch and dream. I've asked a lot of people, have you achieved your dreams in life? And they'd say no. Well, what was your dream? Well, I didn't have one. So how can you achieve it? So businesses must have dreams that align people and inspire people. Business is about serving others. You know, if you create a win-win situation for your owners, for your customers, for your associates, for your communities, and for your vendors. If everyone wins, you serve others, you succeed. You have to seize windows of opportunities. You know, you have to look around yourselves constantly. You have to learn. You have to look at what other businesses are doing, what people are saying, and seize opportunities. And that's what led to no surcharge ATM. It wasn't out of a strategic planning session. It was looking around the business environment and seizing opportunities. You constantly have to climb mountains. And the fun in climbing a mountain, and that is every year increasing the value of the business, increasing ownership for associates, isn't the end result. It's that climb. Because as you climb mountains together, you learn, you build team, teamwork, you overcome obstacles, you become a stronger team. It's important to remain kid-like. Organizations that are old, that begin to mature, die before their time. You know, remain kid-like. Kids fall down, they hurt themselves. What do they do? They get right up and go back and play. Adults, if they fall down and hurt themselves, what do they do? Sit in an armchair and convalesce. Organizations must remain kid-like. We're over 200 years old. We believe we're young. We believe the best is yet to come. But leaders have to keep the organization young. It's important to think big and have processes and te technology, but act small. Customers don't care we're big. They don't care that we do 10 billion in sales. They don't care that we sell 2% of the gas in the United States. They only care about their one store and the associates in that store. So the key to success as a leader is having the processes that are the glue in keeping the company together, but yet always being that small Wawa store. You have to stay humble. You have to have fun. In business and in leadership, you can't take your, yourselves too seriously. You know, we tour stores on Christmas Day, and I always joke that on Christmas Day, my wife and I would go out, and they were always happier to see her than me. That's because she baked them cookies. So you can't take yourself too seriously. You gotta have fun, we celebrate everything. We celebrate store birthdays every five years. You know, we send clowns and magicians into the stores, we party and we invite the customers to come in. And we never forget the lessons from the geese because the goose is our corporate logo. And if you notice geese fly, they always fly information because they fly 71% further information than if they could fly on their own. Our biggest challenge was when we went to Florida, could we transport the culture? We knew we could build stores. We knew we could sell hoagies and coffee, but could we create the magic in Florida that we created in Pennsylvania. So we opened our first store about three years ago uh, in Florida. And again, if you build it, will they come? So this is what happened in store one when we opened in Florida. 
Two big announcements. Wawa is going to open up. Uh, they're going to start with five stores here, but they're going to open up uh, 100 stores uh, nationwide. This is their sixth state. So hopefully, hopefully you like their coffee, their hoagies, things like that. Free ATM. I love Wawa. Some describe Wawa's customer following as cult-like. If the turnout for the convenience chain's first Central Florida store near SeaWorld is any indication, that description is dead on. We drove two and a half hours to get here last night. Are you nuts? No, we got a hotel room. We made a party out of it. Literally hundreds of people crowded in shoulder to shoulder just to get their Wawa. Wawa's great. Inside the store, people are waiting 45 minutes to an hour or more for their sandwiches. Okay. <laughs> Meanwhile, out some people were parking nearly a block away to be a part of the Wawa experience. You know, I'm just saying, Wawa must be pretty excellent. There's this many people here. The question is, why? Everyone we talk with says, the best smoothie I've ever tasted, ever. Pretty much that same thing. People like tourists Michelle and Chris Marano. Friendly sir. Cleanliness of the stores, the quality of the food, everything. It's not really like your typical convenience store. It's just, I don't know, it's better. A truly fanatical following. Wawa, Wawa, Wawa. For Central Florida's newest convenience store. Tom Johnson. We love Wawa. Fox 35 News. Well, we transferred the culture. Uh, for the first couple dozen stores, we transferred people down from Mid Atlantic the store managers and the assistants so that they could transport the culture and then they hired and trained other people in our culture and our values. But the key to success in Florida has been, will be, and wherever we expand, it's just not real estate, it's just not product, it's can we create that unique experience elsewhere in the country. Well, where do we go from here? You know, you have to have a dream and our dream is fulfilling lives each and every day. It's making the lives of our customers better. It's making the lives of our communities better. And we do it every number of way, ways. We're a craving tamer. If you're hungry, we got great food. If you need caffeine, we'll wake you up with coffee. We'll brighten your day with a smile. We do fundraising for our communities. We listen to our customers. We give directions. We cheer people up. There are any number of things that we do that translates into success. This guides our business. This is who we are. This is what we love being. If you focus on quality, if you focus on the heart, then the numbers follow. In business today, and there are a lot of businesses that do it, they focus on the numbers. They have financial goals, but they don't have heart. And they can achieve them short term, but they can't achieve them long term. And that's why as a privately held company where we share ownership, we take a long term point of view because we want customers to be endeared to Wawa. We believe in associate ownership, servant leadership, private ownership, listening to our customers. If we listened to our customers, we wouldn't have made the mistakes that we made, although we learned from those mistakes. We care for people. The word care is so important. Transparency. We tell people everything. We, we don't have secrets. We're very open, very transparent. We all believe in the same values to succeed at Wawa. You have to believe in those values. We keep an open door policy. We constantly reinvent ourselves. And it's as simple as saying hi in the hallways. We don't believe in big egos. We're not a company that hires free agents. We build from within and we have our own farm system. So let me leave you with a few takeaways. Uh, one is in business and in life, and the same thing holds true for one's career. Define your purpose and mission. What business are you in? How can you benefit your customers? What's your higher calling? What's the beacon in the night? What's your dream? If you have a dream and it's, it aspires others and you can align people against that dream, you will succeed. Draw a preferred state. Draw a picture of what it's gonna look like when you get there. But build enough stretch into it that you never get there. The best vision the death's best dream has so much stretch that it's a constant journey. And it will take you to distant places in your own life and in business that you could only dream of. Understand your values. You know, in life, you always want to find a soulmate. In business, in your career, find a soulmate. I've met so many people that were unhappy in their life, unhappy in their career. They found a job, and they found a job that paid money but they didn't find a job that was their soulmate. They didn't find 
a company that shared their values. They didn't find an organization that embraced what they embraced. They didn't truly love the people they worked for. If you find that, you find that passion, you will succeed. You will go to very distant places. And if people decide that you're going to lead, if you decide that you're going to serve others, move to the bottom of the organization. Help paint that picture. Get the input of others. Learn from others. Get their feedback. Empower others, but then move to the bottom and support them. I spent the first 25 years of my career doing human resources. And in human resources, you support others. You help build the careers of other people. As becoming CEO, that helped me out tremendously because I was focused on the needs of others. And if you focus on the needs of others, then your needs will be met. But if you don't focus on the needs of others, chances are your needs will not be met. So this is how Wawa competes. A funny name, a little town, Wawa, Pennsylvania, but yet we compete with world retailers. And again, it all comes down to private, shared ownership and servant leadership. I'd like to invite Rich Wood up now uh, from Washington College <laughs> to, to, share, to share his perspective on family and private ownership. Uh, I have a quick question here. Um, I'll be, I'm going to be pretty brief, but um, how many of you in this room have shopped our stores before? Can I get a show of hands? So we have a lot of really good customers here. This is fantastic. Um, when I go around, people always ask me all the time, what, what makes you successful? And I always say it's our, it's our people and our processes. So uh, Howard talked about that, you know, that shared ownership. You really can't have today the people we have without being privately held and most importantly, that ESOP that we have today. That ESOP, um, if you work for our company, you're over 21 years of age and you work 1,000 hours, you get shares in our ESOP. We just give that to you as part of your compensation. Uh, that frontline associate that checks you out and people say, why are your people so good? They are ESOP owner. They have ownership in this company, which is an equity, shared equity, and that's a huge piece of why we're successful as a business. That person, when you have shared equity, you, you go through that, you're working that store, you're merchandising that store, you have a piece of that, you own part of that store, especially in the retail world that we work in today, so having that piece, so that's really important. And I'm going to share one other secret piece to you. When you have a family business like ours, there's a very important secret here is keep the family out of the business. <laughs> my, my father uh, spent most of his career keeping the family out of the business, and that was very important to him. And his theory in that was right person, right job. And really, if you have family members in your business, when you're five generations like we are, you can't keep and retain the best people. You can't keep and retain a Howard Stokely here and a Chris Geisen, who is our CEO today. These are very powerful people that have done very uh, wonderful things in our business moving up. And if they, you know, if you're there you, for a while and you're moving up in the organization, you think a family member is going to have that top position, you probably leave. You think there's a ceiling in that organization. So, you know, it's really important to, to make sure that you keep the family out. And we have 100, and uh, Howard shared with you, there's the George Woods Trust, and there's about 180 contingent beneficiaries in that trust. So that's a lot of family members looking for employment in the company. <laughs> keeping them out. So um, the way my father always did it was if you, uh, anybody can come work for the business, but you had to, if you were a family member, you had to work a minimum of two years in the stores. So, you know, that was a real commitment if you were a family member to say, hey, I'm going to go work two years in the stores. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to work second, third shifts. I'm going to clean bathrooms. I'm going to stock shelves. Um, so that kept a lot of family members out. And today, there's only two of us that are here uh, doing that. So it, it's, um, you know, very important. But, you know, really as a family member, sharing the ownership of the business with our employees is, uh, you know, a huge very process and something that, you know, it's the right thing to do and it fits right into our values. So I'll open this up for questions now. And Howard, if you want to come up and join me, please do. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. 
encourage uh, sustainability in your supply chain management and in your Love your power. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's a responsible for sustainability. Right, right. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, you know, for, from supply chains, it's actually consolidating your your, your trips to your store. And one of the things, McLean's a great example of that. Um, back in uh, 2003, 2004, we, you know, we sell, did self distribution then, um, and we had all these different trucks coming into to uh, to our stores from DSD vendors. Um, you know, supply trucks, all, all this, and so it was you know, very busy in our stores and it was difficult on our labor model. Um, and then we said, you know, we need a partner that can come in and consolidate all this into one warehouse, one distribution center, so we can be more efficient. We take, uh, cuts down our labor hours from checking in, get, lets our associates uh, work at the register, doing the things they need to do to take care of the customer. So uh, we took probably about five or six of our trucks that came to the stores come into a DC center, so now we only have one truck coming to the stores three times a week or four or five, depending on the volume of that store. So it takes a lot of trucks off the road. That gets carbon emissions out of the air. Um, and, you know, really consolidation of all that into one place. McLean has been a fantastic partner for doing that for us. I think they learned a lot from us, too, about um, cold chain supply, which they really hadn't done before because we've been in that parcels business since, uh, you know, 1902 when we started home milk delivery. And probably it's one of the reasons why we were such a good perishable business today with our food service offer. Um, but around sustainability, it's very important in our business. We, um, we have recycling in all the stores that we have. When I took over sustainability back in uh, 2009, we didn't have any recycling in our stores. And it was something that I worked on over the last five years to, you know, get that capital invest in our stores to get the equipment in there and to get the suppliers to take, um, you know, the re recyclable materials out of the stores into these uh, MRF facilities to recycle them. Now, it was, what we did find is it's actually... Um, you get a return on investment when you do that because it costs less money to uh, take that recycled material to a recycling facility than it does to a landfill. So we were getting return on investment, which our, which our management team was very happy about. The other opportunity there as well is to our food waste. So we have um, um, a large, you know, I think it was probably about 48% of, of our waste going out was food waste. So most of that being coffee grounds, so it's not food that couldn't be, couldn't be reused. Uh, but one of the things we were able to do was collect some of that food waste for composting. We don't compost at the store, but to take it out through commercial haulers to these uh, commercial composting facilities that can do that. Um, but then we also, we donate a lot of that product now today. So we have these food banks, or we actually have a, a, a single third party that comes in, collects all that. Uh, it's, it's, it's food that's good. It's just out of our quality standards, but it's still good to eat. They collect that, they distribute that out to the food banks, and they get that done in a 24-hour period. And uh, we're able to feed people. And, then, and some people, they're really happy to be able to eat a walla sizzle. It makes them feel good again that they're some people that are down, down and out. So we're working on sustainability. We're actually in the process right now of building a corporate social responsibility uh, function at our, at our uh, office, which goes way beyond sustainability into a lot of other things about um, being good corporate stewards uh, in our community. So I can probably talk about more about that later as we get that, that completed. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Yes. My question was, in a general sense, what were the main reasons for failure in entering a new market? And does Wawa have any plans to enter new markets? I mean, without getting into specifics of those plans, but what is the direction? Very good question. We had stores in Connecticut, had over 30 stores, and we sold all those stores. Lessons learned, one, is that we had acquired some sites from others, and we were not able to turn them into Wawa sites. We're much better and organic growth, picking the piece of property, picking the marketplace, the community, and building that store from scratch. Uh, there was a time when we had stores in Staten Island, New York. They failed miserably. We bought the assets of others. Two, back in those days, we just didn't have the right mentality. Um, we sold Eagle T-shirts uh, up in <laughs> Connecticut. That's Die Hard Giant Country. It's symbolic of we just weren't quite focused from a branding standpoint. We had winners, like at Yale University, but we had a lot of stores that were inferior sites. Uh, many of those stores we had bought from others. So we learned that the best way to approach the business was organic. And Connecticut's a high cost market to do business, uh, and it's hard to get zoned. Could we succeed there today if we went back? Like I said, with gas, we failed the right. first time, uh, succeeded the second time. 
Uh, we now serve cappuccino and latte. We tried it 20 years ago and failed, but now we've succeeded with it. If we went back with today's model, with gas and a restaurant to go, I think we could probably hmm. succeed in Connecticut without a doubt. The problem in Connecticut is getting real estate, affordable real estate, and getting the local people to give you the zoning and permitting to build. So that would probably be the biggest obstacle. I think we'd have the confidence to do it. I think we have the brand that we could position. We could transport the culture easier there than we did to Florida. But I think to get real estate would be very, very difficult. But I never want to say never because you never know. But it's not likely to be in the market. Yeah, and, and I agree with Howard completely on that. I think of, with fuel today, um, we could do a much better job than we did in Connecticut. Um, I guess it was back in the early 90s that we, we sold out there. Um, you know, when you're looking at a new market, you're saying, okay, I have this much capital to spend, and, and, and what's the best place for me to go? So you want to find a place where you can find the right real estate um, and, you know, a place where you can get open very quickly. And, and again, you know, Connecticut connect, connect would be a little more difficult for that, but there doesn't mean we won't be there someday. We learn from mistakes. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Michael Mann. I'm a double major in business management and uh, music. And my question for you is, uh, Mr. Wood, is what did you learn at, um, what was the biggest thing you took from Washington College um, and you used out in the real world? Um, that's a great question. I love this college, actually. I had a, I, I'm a very passionate alumni about the college, and I've always stayed very close to it. Uh, when I was here, I was a uh, American Studies major with a large emphasis on political science. Um, you know, when I left school, I said, I'm, I want to get into policymaking down in Washington, and I tried that for a while and, and uh, realized I didn't have the right network for that, so I went back and got into business. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the and I do the legislative work today, and, and that always stuck with me. It was something that I you know, got out of the school and the work I was doing here and the internships I was doing on the Hill at the same time. That's a, a great, you know, when you are in college in your summers, the beach sounds great, but, but really if you want to build a resume, go do those internships because that is very important for your resume when you go forward and giving you that business experience. So I think that really my undergraduate degree, more than even my, my business degree, uh, uh, is kind of was my passion, what I wanted to do later. And, and Back in 2011, Howard came to me and said, you know, I've been chirping at him for, for many years about we could be more, a larger voice in the world of uh, government and regulation, and we can do more with that. And he, and he uh, said in 2011, the, our general counsel was leaving, he said, well, I'm going to have you run government relations now. Can you take that, build a department? And I said, oh, okay, I can, I can do that, and I'm very excited to do that. And within a year, I'd already had a piece of federal legislation passed uh, in a do-nothing Congress in the JOBS Act. So all of a sudden, the leadership team, everybody said, yeah, yeah, we can be a voice here. We can do that. And it was just something I picked up from my time at Washington College and work my undergraduate studies here. Yes. Well, uh, very good question. How do we make sure that we're aligned with our store teams? Uh, right now, the leadership team every year goes out to every region in the company, uh, and they conduct uh, what we did call New Connections Tour. Now they're called Goose Jams. And they invite everyone to these meetings to share the vision for the future, to get input on the vision and how we can make it better. And we share Bible stories, uh, and we listen very attentively. Uh, the leadership team goes into the stores, tour the stores, talk to the part-time associates, find out what's happening. Uh, we do all types of surveys with our people uh, in terms of are we living the values, are we walking the talk, give us feedback. You know, what are we doing well, what can we do better, and then we put together teams of people to improve what we can do better. Uh, and we're very transparent and we share, you know, all those results. Uh, so when you publish your values, your associates look at that, and you have to make certain that you're living those values, and you have to have the measurement systems to make sure that our general managers in every single store live those values, and our store people evaluate their leadership 
on whether or not they're living their values. And if they're not delivering the Wawa brand, living those values, we take that very seriously. Uh, so it's being very hands-on. It's getting out in the field. It's being there Christmas Day. It's being there at night. It's being there on weekends on occasion, listening, talking, and getting the pulse of the organization. It's never-ending. Um, and one thing my father did when he was a CEO, and we still do today, something he called Flounder's Day, where all the, um, the top manager of the company has to go out and work in the stores uh, one, one day a year or two days a year. And he calls it Flounder's Day because they flounder around the store and get in the way of everybody else, and they don't know what they're doing, but they're really uh, they're learning, uh, you know, what's going on in the store? What, what, what do the associates need? Uh, you know, what, what keeps them up at night? So it's, it gets them very close to their daily jobs and what they're doing. That still happens today. We don't call it Flounder's Day anymore, but... All the uh, vice presidents and the directors in the organization have to work in the stores at least once a year. I think our marketing team who uh, puts our platforms out there is out there four times a year, so every quarter they're out there in the stores understanding that. And, and really at the end of the day, our associates are always constantly, when we're doing any new concepts, we're, we're in the stores, we're working with those folks. If we're not actually working at the store, we're understanding how, how they're executing so that we're not putting platforms and programs out there that um, they're too difficult for our associates to execute. That's very important. because. Our associates are the front line. I mean, it, the battle, the share of heart that Howard talked about is won and lost right at that register, right at that point of purchase, and we know that as an organization. Our associates have an emotional connection to the business. They have a financial connection. They're not shy. Uh, they're willing to send you an email. They're willing to pick up the phone and call. In some companies, you never call the leader of the business. I would say the vast majority of our associates don't think twice when you walk into a store to tell you what's on their mind. And that's what builds a great business. I actually don't have a question. I just wanted to point to the Okay, thank you for directing. Where are we here? Okay, yes, ma'am. Well, we've paid well above the minimum wage for years. And when you look at compensation, you have to look at the hourly rate and the benefits and ownership of the business. So if you look at the total compensation, uh, we've been well above our competition. But our jobs are difficult. Working in a Wawa is a lot different uh, than working at a McDonald's. Uh, so we are and have been several dollars above uh, the minimum wage. If you want to attract good people, you have to pay accordingly. Um, and we want more and more of our people to achieve their dreams in life. And that's not only hourly income or a salary if they determine to be a leader, uh, but it's also ownership in the business. And if people work 1,000 hours a week, 1,000 hours a year, 20 hours a week, they can own a piece of Wawa. And over a period of time, that's significant. Um, we just, uh, and, and that's a great question, I, I, in my role I deal with it all the time. Um, we just made a commitment as an organization um, to take our wages up, uh, and $15 is, that, is what you hear out there all the time. The state of New York, um, they it's actually did through rulemaking, I didn't mean, legislate it, but they're going to be to $15 an hour by 2021, I believe. We made a commitment to get to $15 an hour starting wage by 2021, uh, and, and actually beat the New York law. which. So when I, you know, you see this in Maryland now, they, they put a bill out there, um, and I think New Jersey has one as well, um, they're, and they're all around New York, or they're 2024, some $15. Now, we'll beat all those wages. Now, we can beat them as long as the economy continues the way it is, as long as our business continues uh, moving forward the way it is, we can get there. When it gets mandated, you know, from a legislative uh, component, it gets difficult, though, because the economy turns the other way, and you have to start paying wages, and your business going the other way, then, then you got some problems out there. So I'm not a proponent, usually, of mandating it, but I, we are big believers in the business should, you know, take that step forward, pay a living wage, uh, and take care of our associates. Again, the ESOP is, you know, a way we like to make sure we do that as well. You know, we had a conversation earlier. Right? True, I always talk to legislators about this as well. True, uh, you know, wealth is made is an equity. It's an ownership. That's where wealth becomes. And, um, you know, we, we like to celebrate that and make that happen. Um, when I teach leadership, students often start out thinking 
kind of believing leaders know a lot of stuff. And I, I think you guys have done a wonderful job of, of explaining leaders have to learn a lot of stuff. Right. Learn from associates, learn from customers. So uh, in, in light of Howard in particular, with that long, detailed look at how to kind of build a company and the working with associates, do you have a favorite question or set of questions that kind of keeps you grounded and listening to associates? Well, it's all about servicing. Are they servicing? What are the barriers? What are the obstacles? Uh, and them servicing their jobs. You know, I'm admire of Southwest Airlines. They keep things simple. Uh, they have processes. They remove the barriers so that their people can service the needs of their customers. So it's always about what can we do to get collectively better to service the needs of our customers. What are we doing that can be improved? Because you've got to improve constantly. The world around us is changing. Competition is getting better. Um, and you know, what can we do that we're not doing? What are customers saying that we need to hear? You need to constantly saturate yourself with the voice of all stakeholders. So it's, it's always becoming a learning organization. And as I said earlier, organizations die before their time. They become mature. I would argue they stop listening. They stop listening to the people who deliver the brand. You wonder at Yellow Cab, the cab driver said years ago, you should embrace technology and do what Uber's doing. You wonder at Blockbuster if someone said, we need to get into the Netflix type of business. If you don't listen, time does pass you by. So it's listening to what customers are saying and what our associates think about the business. Perfect. Yes. Oh, our pleasure. Um, my, sec my question is, um, first, you have spoken a lot about adding services to your industry and listening to your customers. Now, as part of um, a growing business and as part of um, listening to your customers, um, specifically in terms of, let's say, gas services, um, we are an economy that's moving towards a greener economy, more environmentally friendly. Would you consider removing a service rather than adding a service in order to have a more sustainable long-term business model, or um, what are your thoughts? You want to come? So, I think your question is around renewable fuels or things of that sort. Um, you know, everything's market-driven, so uh, what, what the market will bear for you, and if it, there's, uh, there's um, fuels or different things we can do that um, we can offer that are more sustainable, we'll, we'll go in that direction. Today, you know, we had a great conversation at lunch, at, you know, with the barrel of oil at $38 a barrel. Cheap oil is n not always the best thing for when you're trying to get to more uh, a greener society and more renewable fuels, but it is what it is. And we actually even, they were even surprised. And I said, I, I w we've supported taxes on fuels in order to get those prices up, even when the president's uh, tax at $10 a barrel, as long as they go, the, the tax dollars go to infrastructure and back to the country. Uh, last week, we opened up our first compressed natural gas fueling store. Um, you know, compressed natural gas, is it's a potential future. Again, it's something I don't think that will get mainstream in this country until the barrel of oil gets up above $150 again, and we're paying $5 a gallon for gas, and CNG is, uh, you know, prices out somewhere around $1.75 if you fill it up with a vehicle. It's, uh, it does produce about 50% less uh, greenhouse gas emissions when you use a CNG vehicle, but again, it's, um, it's kind of the chicken and egg thing. It's, you know, the manufacturers won't build that car until there's a, a mechanism out there to, to, to fuel it with. And the retailers like us are saying, well, we don't want to sell the fuel until the vehicle's out there and we've got to figure this out. And this is probably an area where maybe government can come in and, and support and help um, and make that happen. But, uh, you know, we're interested in it. But again, you know, you, we have a stakeholder that, that we were responsible for. Our associates are responsible for, so we've got to make good, sound business decisions that we're not taking our capital dollars and putting towards things that won't give us a return for the stakeholder and the associates that keeps them employed. Yes. Hi, I'm Audrey Etchen. I'm a junior business management major. Um, so my question for you is, you guys just talked about how your distributors have learned a little bit from you. What can other public companies and even some other private companies take away from the WALA way of business and um, use it to, to their advantage? And then also, what would the next step be for WALA to continue feeding um, your competitors? <laughs> well, I think the lessons learned is staying true to yourself and taking a long-term point of view 
and not being at the whims of Wall Street. I think so many companies are at the whims of Wall Street and they make short-sighted decisions that aren't in the best interest of their brand, their stakeholders, and particularly their associates. So it's having the courage, and some companies do it better in terms of managing Wall Street uh, than other companies uh, in, in terms of uh, Wall Street. Um, so that, to me, is a big takeaway. Uh, and I think the other takeaway is empower your people. You know, not every company lets ordinary people collectively do extraordinary things. Um, in terms of the future, dream. You know, we're dreaming. We, we want to fulfill customer needs. We want to fill the needs of the communities. This is a big nation. There are a lot of places we can do it, but we want to stay too true to ourselves. We want to be important wherever we go. We know we can't go everywhere, so we have to very, be very selective in terms of what we do in our current marketplace and what marketplaces we go into in the future. Um, and we'll change with the times, whether it be fuel sources, products, whatever the customers want, we need to find a way to bring it to the customers in a convenient fashion and become part of their lives. Yeah, I mean, I say exactly that. The LRP, the long-term approach, when we do, uh, when we look at our business, we look out 10, 15 years. Uh, we, you know, so we know what we're doing 15 years from now. We know what our capital plan looks like. A public company doesn't do that. They're looking at a quarter. Um, you know, Howard worked for a public company. I worked for a public company for six years. You know, if, if the earnings are going the wrong way, all of a sudden your travel budget cut. You can't go out to see your customer. You can't do the things that you were trained to do and supposed to do. That's not a really good way to do business. So I don't know as much we can teach public companies, but uh, the private companies goes back to what Howard says, empowering your people. Um, story I like to use a lot is um, my father was talking to an assistant manager in a store once, and, and all the, three, three of the four registers went down. There was only one register open in the middle of our coffee rush in that store. So the lines built up very quickly in the store, and the general manager was in the store there to, to, to take over. The system manager was there, and the system manager said, said, anybody that's just purchasing coffee, the coffee's free, it's on the house, you, you can just walk out the door, everybody else come to the register line. The key to that was that, that was an assistant manager that felt empowered to give the coffee away free to their customers and associates to move the store along and, and to get people out of the store. So that's empowerment down at that level, at that store level from assistant manager, it's very important. They feel empowered, we give them, we give them the platform to be empowered at that level. So they understood that was the right thing to do in our values. One thing we would like to see in the future is more associate ownership, more and more. So, uh, we need to repeat these are all <laughs> if you would let us. <laughs> uh, but before we wrap this up, and there will be a book signing afterwards, uh, from our flock to yours, we have uh, some gifts for you right behind you there. <laughs> oh, Jay, wow. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Howard Rich, this was a really special afternoon. Thank you so much. I know how busy both of you are. Thank you for Thank giving you. us so much time. My pleasure. Excellent questions. Very proud of the students, too. Uh, so, we will be signing some books uh, before they leave. And thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Best of luck to everyone. Thank you for being here. Okay. Oh, that's great.